you're going to use the measuring stick to measure the temple of God. So in Revelation chapter 11, verse 1, I read to you that the Apostle John was told to get a reed like unto a rod. So he gets a reed like a rod, so it's like a measuring stick like this. He's going to use it to measure the temple of God. Okay, now here comes this question is that, all right, what is this temple of God? Remember at the book of Revelation chapter 8, there was a temple of God and an altar up in heaven. So some people think that this temple of God is referring to the temple up in heaven. But no, it's not in heaven. It's on the earth, actually. You might say, why is it on the earth, Pastor? The reason why it's going to be on the earth is because he's going to be talking about Jerusalem, actually. So you're going to see that over there. Let's keep reading. Okay, let's look back at our main text over here. The Bible says, measure the temple of God and the altar and notice them that worship therein. This is a place where people, them, the people are coming to worship. So there's an altar here. Then people who are actually going to worship in there. <coughs> All right, let's keep reading. Let's go back to our main text. But the court, which is without the temple. Now, if you know your Bible, when the Jews had their temple, the court is outside right over here. So the court, which is without the temple, the Bible says to leave out. Is, that's where we read it from the text over there. So the court. Court, which is without the temple. See, it's without the temple. The temple is not in it. The court, which is without the temple, leave out. You leave it out and measure it not. This should not be measured. So... John is told to measure these, not here. All right, let's keep reading. Why is that, Pastor? Because, notice as it reads, the next part of verse 2. For it is given unto the Gentiles. Ah, the heathen, the Gentiles. They're going to be the one that's going to take this over. What are they going to do with God's court here? Wait a minute. If this is given to the heathen, then this means that this temple is not up in heaven then. Ah, so then this is referring, think about it, if it's referring to a Jewish temple with a Jewish court, Jewish altar, if that's not the one up in heaven, there's, then we know obviously what it's talking about. It's talking about on the earth. So this is an earthly Jewish temple. We're going to Jerusalem then, on the earth. The heathen, the Gentiles take it. And the holy city, ah, that's plain now, so now we know that's Jerusalem. The holy city shall they tread underfoot. The Gentiles, they're going to trample this. Trodden underfoot, 40 and two months, three and a half years right here. So the Gentiles get this place for three and and a half years. So notice that they're desecrating, they take over the Jerusalem court and the city. Is that what's going to happen? Well, we're going to look at the, keep your bookmark over here at Revelation 11. We're going to go to Matthew 24. Go to Matthew 24 and Daniel 9. We're going to go to Daniel 9 and Matthew 24. There's a desecration going on over here, an abomination of desolation, so to speak. All right, Daniel chapter 9, we're going to read verse 27. So this passage has been used, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week in the midst of the week. Okay, so it says one week midst of the week, right? So it's one week equals seven days. So right here, one week equals seven days. 
Now notice, notice it says in the middle of the week. What's the middle then? That's three and a half. See that? Now in the Bible, what we do is that the Bible says that the book of 2 Peter, a day with the Lord is a thousand years as a thousand years as one day. Also, the Bible shows that in the book of uh, Deuteronomy, I believe, chapter 2, that for 40 days they were out spying out the land, that it was representing 40 years as well. So each day could represent one year. <clears throat> This is the only passage, just letting you all know this, this is the only passage in the entire Bible where we get our seven-year tribulation from. There's no other passage. That's the reason why we're going to say that this is seven-year tribulation. One biblical day equals one year. All right, now, so then it says three and a half years, right? We know that. Why? So then there's a desecration going on in three and a half years. Over here in the midst of the, in the midst of that three and a half, what's happening? A desolation, desecration. Midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations. See, the Gentiles treading it underfoot. See that? The overspreading of abominations. He shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Look at Matthew 24. Notice Jesus, what he says concerning the tribulation. Verse 15. When he therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Remember Daniel 9.27? Abomination of desolation from Daniel. Stand in the what? Holy place. Remember, go, if you go back to Revelation 11, the, the temple and the court is where? In the holy city, right? So Matthew 24 is undoubtedly talking about the same thing. Matthew 24 says holy place, they're going to do it. The abomination of desolation. That's where we get this idea from. See that? So in the middle of the seven year of tribulation, the Antichrist and the Gentiles are going to come in and take over the Temple Mount. They're going to stop the Jewish worship system. <clears throat> Let's go back to Revelation 11. Now notice it says that it's called the Holy City. So notice that if it's talking about a Jewish temple, Jewish court, Jewish altar, it's called Holy City. That means then that Rome is not the Holy City God is looking at. God gives an opposite name. He calls it Babylon, you know, Revelation 17 and 18. But Jerusalem is known as the holy city. Well, you know, the Jews rule all over the world. If you look at the conspiracies, the Rothschilds at the top of the pyramid, the Jews are evil and blah, blah, blah. And then you fall into this anti-Semitism trap. You know, they always confuse that when they find several Jewish elites over there, they automatically dub that the whole nation. That's what they think. You know, the problem is this, is that what they fail to see is that the Antichrist, which I showed you in our last Revelation study, he's a Jew. He's a Jewish elite. But guess what? He goes against the nation of Israel. See, they automatically assume if you see a Jewish elite, they're for the nation of Israel. No, they can go against the nation of Israel. That's what's going to happen at the tribulation. That's a problem with some people. They don't really get it. All right, let's go back to our main text. I'm going to lay Revelation chapter 11, verse 3. So the Antichrist is going to take over that place, right? And I will give power unto my two witnesses. So God's going to send two witnesses to take care of this issue. All right, now, there's a question about who are these two witnesses, one, 
And the second question is, when do these two witnesses show up? Now, I noticed that in Dr. Upman's Bible study charts and outline, it seems like, I could be wrong, but what it looks like is that these two witnesses are pl placed at the latter three and a half year of the tribulation. I tend to lean toward that way. You might say, why do you lean toward that way? The reason why is, notice verse 1 through 2, that's the abomination of desolation. When does that abomination of desolation take place? The latter three and a half year, right? Yeah, because it says in the midst of the week, see, the middle of the week, after the first three and a half passed, then in the middle of that week, where did this cloth come from? It's, oh, well, anyway. So in the middle of that week, then what? The abomination of desolation. See, this desecration. Revelation 11, 1 through 2 says, once this abomination of desolation, this, desera this desecration takes place, what happens next at verse 3? I will give power unto my two witnesses. See that? So it seems like that these are coming at, these two witnesses are coming at a time the Antichrist is desecrating the whole Jerusalem temple. Why would, why would God send his two witnesses during that time, Pastor? Because that's a time the Jews need help. Yeah. They're going to be persecuted by the Antichrist. See, so that makes a lot of sense when they're going to show up. So let's see. I'm just running out of space here. Okay, two witnesses. So we can put them at the ladder. Three and a half. That's what we see. Now, the next question. Who are the two identities? A lot of people like to say Enoch and Elijah. That's been a famous thing. The reason why they like to say Enoch and Elijah is because Elijah never died and Enoch never uh, died. They both got raptured, so it's going to be those two people. But there's one thing that uh, I really don't understand why they don't think is that why do they think the qualification to be a two witnesses is when you're raptured? Right, yeah. yeah, so, I mean, it makes yeah. sense. I get it, why they would naturally think Enoch and Elijah, because they never died. But the thing is this, is that there's no qualification yeah. for that in the Bible. Yeah, it just says there's two witnesses. Yeah. By the way, you got a whole bunch of Christians who are going to be raptured before the tribulation, right? Yeah. There's going to be thousands of us, right. if not millions of us, raptured up to heaven before the tribulation. Right. So it's not just two people who never right. experienced death. It's going to be right. thousands. Yeah. yeah. So that's why it's not a good argument to say Enoch and Elijah. Now, one of their arguments is this, is that Hebrews 9.27. So let's look at that one. This is their other argument. The reason why it has to be Enoch and Elijah is because every man has to die at least once. Yeah. So that's their argument. So because... We're going to see later on in the verse, but the two witnesses, if you read Revelation 11 later on, they do die. So if it's Enoch and Elijah who never tasted death and got rapture, it would make sense that they tasted death once at Revelation 11. And thus, everyone died at least once. So let's look at Hebrews 9, 27. <clears throat> And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this a judgment. So notice right here, generally man has to die once, and then the judgment comes. But here's another problem. Uh, again, returning to the pre-trib rapture argument. Every man is not going to die once. Yeah. Right. There's going to be people who will not taste death right. and go to heaven at the pre-tribulation rapture. Yeah. Right. A second argument is this. There are people who didn't die once. They died twice. Lazarus, he died, got resurrected, he died again. The boy that Elijah raised up from the dead, he died once, and guess what? He died again. Elisha raised up another woman, sir. He died once and he died again. See, there are a lot of people. Uh, so this, this statement in Hebrews 9.27 is just simply saying a general rule. That's it. It's not an absolutist statement that every single person has to die. That's not what it is. It's a general rule that generally mankind has to die. It's the same thing with how our society functions too. Within our society, there are always rules, but they're generally used and we allow exceptions. If you, speed, if you go over the speed limit, for example, you do get a ticket. 
That's the general uh, rule and penalty. But sometimes what? The cops, they make an exception for you, right? That's why you're especially nice, right? <laughs> That's why it makes sense Elijah and Enoch were especially nice guys that the Lord made an exception for. That's just natural in life. There are exceptions to general rule. And that's a logical, that's a rule of logic too. I don't know if you heard of that. It's a rule of logic. Exceptions only prove the rule, actually. They don't disprove the rule. That's a phrase that's actually a logical form of use of argument. Okay, let's go back to Revelation, please. Let's go back to Revelation. I will give power to the two witnesses, right? Okay, who's the one that's speaking here? The one who's speaking is Revelation 11, verse 1, the angel who stood, right? Okay, remember the angel who stood at Revelation chapter 10, verse 2? Mm -hmm. One foot on this, he was standing, right? One foot on the sea, one foot on the earth. That angel is saying, I'm going to give the power, verse 3, to the two witnesses. And he said, my two witnesses. This is, again, another supporting verse that this mysterious angel at Revelation 10 is Jesus Christ then. See that? Because he said, my witnesses, I give the power to them. So that's another supporting verse that the angel at Revelation chapter 10, whose identity we were searching for, would be referring to Jesus Christ.